Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, this is Orphan Last, aka Skylar Madison, and today I'm going to be drawing some fan art for an intellectual property that doesn't really come up on search results very well unless you include the word book with the title inside of a search result. But still, this intellectual property has a very loyal fan base. Now, in my previous video, I was drawing a fan art image of Star Wars while mentioning the shortfalls of the Star Wars franchise. And although I'm sure Star Wars has a bit of a future still, I think that if there continues to be as many missteps as what we've been seeing in the last five years, then the only remaining fans of Star Wars is going to be children regardless of if that's what Disney wants or not. They say it's for children, but I'm sure that they would appreciate the adult audience. But if it continues, they're going to completely lose the adult audience uh, because the adults just won't be able to make sense of any of it. And it's basically becoming Metal Gear, uh, something which is executed well, visually, scene by scene, but where the actual story makes no sense. That's what Metal Gear was, and that's what Star Wars is ultimately becoming. And that brings me to discuss this image that I'm working on right here, right now, which is Galaxy's Edge fan art. I understand it's confusing because Disney made a theme park named Galaxy's Edge and a few books with a subtitle called Galaxy's Edge, but I'm thinking that Disney did that purely to try and do a sneaky sneaky to create brand confusion and the potential for legal disputes in the future should Galaxy's Edge steal away the Star Wars fan base. And genuinely, I think that it's only a matter of time until Galaxy's Edge does just that. It's far easier for a fan base to get on board and accept a clear narrative moving an actual intended direction without the meandering, outright stupid missteps that Disney has made with Star Wars, which at this point has already crossed the line towards absolute and total stupidity. After the latest Star Wars trilogy, starting with The Force Awakens, people are just hoping that the broken pieces can be put back together again and still love it through the nostalgic effects it's had on them with bittersweet hope for the future. So in other words, there's a lot of people that are still fans of Star Wars purely based on a sympathy vote and not a vote of confidence. With Galaxy's Edge, you don't need the sympathy vote. You can give a vote of full confidence with Galaxy's Edge. And I'll try to tell you about Galaxy's Edge without any sort of spoiler because I'm telling you the discovery of this book series is every bit as enjoyable of an experience as Star Wars was the very first time. And I've had a few brief conversations with the authors on social media and from what it sounds like, they're doing what they can to get it launched as a TV series. In quite a bit of ways, what I'm saying in this video is a review of the verbal performance of Jason Anspach, I'm sorry if I butcher your name, Nick Cole, the authors of the series, and the verbalized performance of the audiobook performed by R.C. Bray. In concert, these three voices have formed a performance that has universal appeal. And if you think about it, TV and Audible are the new cinema these days. Why go to the theater when you have so many hours worth of endless content to watch on one of the two streaming services or something that you happen to be paying for right now? So this is the right platform for the authors to be wanting to take Galaxy's Edge, in my opinion. And to be honest, I think that Galaxy's Edge is exactly what Star Wars should have eventually become, but didn't. Although the books and audiobooks are not foul-mouthed, and although neither delve into any sexual content, at least up to the point to where I've listened and read to, it's clear to me that although it can appeal to 12-year-olds and up, even younger, obviously geared towards entertaining the adult fanbase. And it does this just by the maturity of the narrative. Characters that are relatable in a fairly realistic way. The things that I appreciate about Galaxy's Edge is that the narrative doesn't rely on gimmicks similar to yet another Death Star or yet another MacGuffin to hunt down, but instead it winds up depending on the characters and the intrigue of the world. Though there are spiritual and supernatural aspects to the world of Galaxy's Edge, it takes multiple books just for you to even get a droplet of it inside of the narrative. And even then, these supernatural powers are
are described through third-person accounts, which is a less reliable account. Fourth-person narrative isn't reliable, like a game of telephone. Finally, when this supernatural power is presented inside of the present tense in the narrative, it's used only once to describe the first person that's truly wielding supernatural powers, and then you have to dig into the next book to see if you get another drop. It makes this power a hell of a lot more special, rather than depending on it desperately, in order to have an excuse for why your story doesn't make sense. Again, that sounds like Star Wars. Galaxy's Edge is the natural alternative that's superior. It doesn't depend on supernatural forces to tell the narrative. The reason why I find this appealing is because although a narrative like Game of Thrones has things like magic and dragons, you know, supernatural stuff, the narrative of the story doesn't put an emphasis on these things. It took multiple books for Game of Thrones to start to ever so slowly trickle these concepts more and more to reveal that these these things are more than just a myth and legend, and the tapestry of the world was all the better for it because it made the world feel real and grounded. It created a very strong and powerful suspension of disbelief, making the story more believable because it introduced the world with relatable things. Comparatively, that's what the Galaxy's Edge book series does. You're introduced to the ensemble cast of characters, and you start to care about them. What I didn't expect when going from book to book was following different characters than who we were following inside of the first book, until they wind up converging into the same narrative, and sometimes discover that a character you've been following all along played a supportive character in the previous book. So initially, it gives the sense that characters are introduced in no particular order, but in the long term, it makes you feel a sense that there's a character arc you never anticipated, a reward for participating in the world of Galaxy Galaxy's Edge when you least expect it. The way it's pulled off immediately gets you to care about newly introduced characters while even further expanding the tapestry of the world they live in. A tapestry of variously different forces in the universe, the mysteries within, the organizations, guilds, industry, and policies of each for the characters to have to endure. And in a way that's similar, but very tributarily unique, there's plenty of Han solo sort of moments. But let me be clear, the characters have more depth. Inside of Galaxy's Edge, there's absolutely no moments at all where characters are seeing common occurrences like the equivalent of stormtroopers flying with jetpacks, and so the characters say, They fly now? They fly now? They fly now? There's no moments like that inside of Galaxy's Edge. You get into the heads of the characters, and it's hard to really describe on any sort of scale how to really measure that. But if the Dune Saga is listed as the extreme case of how a narrator gets into characters' heads, let's give it a representation and value of 10, being the most that a book can go ahead and get into all these different characters' heads, okay? If that's where the Dune Saga rests, and let's say that Orson Scott Card's writing in the process of getting into a character's head is about a 5, I'd say that Galaxy's Edge gets into the heads of the characters about a 7. So it's pretty high up there. And I mention Orson Scott Card because he's one of my favorite science fiction authors. And as for Frank Herbert's work with the Dune Saga, Dune will always be the Shakespeare of science fiction as far as I'm concerned. And Galaxy's Edge is resting where Star Wars used to be on this measuring scale. Villains in Galaxy's Edge are introduced through war stories, where so much has happened in such a short series of decades, that mentioning a war that took place 30 years ago previous to the present narrative feels as though they're talking about an age long gone, as if it happened back when Vikings roamed the earth. And it may take multiple books before a villain introduced inside of a war story from an age long gone finally makes a present tense 
introduction into the narrative, which gives the world an immense sense of validity, a tapestry of history, similar to Babylon 5 in that respect which is high praise, very high praise. If I could hand out a prize for the Michael J. Straczynski in similitude to Babylon 5 award, and if that award actually existed, I'd hand it to the authors of Galaxy's Edge. What I find most interesting about the narrative of Galaxy's Edge is how it switches from omniscient narration to first-person narration from time to time, and this makes a narrative every bit as compelling as a John Williams score. When flying in space, feels different from being on a planet. Changing from omniscient to first person requires the reader to think differently, the same as a John Williams score used to narrate both sort of scenes. Very similar. I just had to repeat that twice in two different ways. What I'm saying here is the authors know what they're doing. The transitions are well executed and masterfully done. Some notable characters in the series are Tiberius Rex, the T-Rex of the galaxy, a veteran of the Savage Wars, who became a bounty hunter with the best Legion armor to exist, back when the Legion would actually make armor with the intent of keeping the Legion safe. He's experienced so much trauma that when he's in combat, his PTSD is triggered and he relives battle after battle. Trauma after trauma. And yet, he's able to focus on the present moment well enough to become a modern living galactic legend. Like an urban legend, only on a galactic scale. He's become something bigger than anything he ever intended to be, like the Boogeyman. The next character of note is KRS-88, otherwise known as Crash. Crash is an attendant robot, so basically he's a glorified butler as a robot. However, he's unique because he has a warbot frame. So although his physical appearance is built like a tank, the operating system gets this tank to operate and behave like a butler. Although his behavior is very much dignified and proper, he is a force to be reckoned with. The way a robot should be inside of a narrative. A tool for humanity. And he has a surprise backstory narrated in a bittersweet moment that I think will stand the test of time. It's a robot and it's so bittersweet. Think of that for a moment. No one ever thought that about C-3PO. There was never any moment of bittersweetness with C-3PO. The next character of note is Asian Keel. This is a character I can't talk too much about without somewhat of having a spoiler, but his exploits are fun, somewhat like Han Solo, but in its own very unique way. He's very sarcastic, and yet he has a past which makes him become a completely different person, like a boogeyman. Think Marty McFly from Back to the Future, when Marty pretends to be Darth Vader to present an ultimatum to his father. The next character of note is Prisma, a little girl whose resume is quite impressive but not impossible for a girl so young with so many resources and so many traumas. This, I think, would have been the hardest thing for a person to write inside of any sort of narrative, and they pulled it off. The next character of note is Skriz. Skriz is a Wobonki which is somewhat of a large, deadly, sort of feline alien creature, who are notably quick to agitation and deadly outbursts, who at one such moment on the verge of overwhelming frustration experienced the sudden sensation of Prisma petting him. The experience was so jarring that his initial reaction was to attack. But what was he going to do? Attack a little girl? And so he just let her continue, knowing that somehow it was soothing to her. A little girl with so much trauma. And in time, he found that he needed it, like he needed religion. Prisma, to him, is like a kind of priest, purely because she would pet him like a house cat. I just think that's an interesting little dynamic there. Now listen, I can talk on and on about this book series, but... In the end, things need to wrap up. It's a good series. Check it out. Get it on Audible. That's the way that I would recommend it. I really don't 
really consider my channel to be a review critique sort of thing but I don't know maybe I might do it a little bit more often if I were to delve into giving Galaxy's Edge a score in terms of quality I would give it a 10 out of 10. The original trilogy of Star Wars was a 10 out of 10. The prequel series for Star Wars was about a 3 out of 10. The Disney trilogy is a 0 out of 10 because my way of rating things allows me to say it's not even worth watching. And the Dune Saga would also be listed as a 10 out of 10. I would say that Ender's Game is something like an 8 or a 9 out of 10. So uh, I'd say an 8.5 out of 10. That would be Ender's Game, uh, but uh, the rest of the Ender's Saga wound up as a whole being something like a 5 out of 10. But the Ender's Shadow series was definitely a 10 out of 10 as a saga itself. Uh, so this kind of helps you kind of get an understanding as to how my measuring system is kind of operating and such like that. Galaxy's Edge is a 10 out of 10. It's genuine high quality. In conclusion, I'd like to talk about the image for a bit. Basically, I tried out Autodesk Sketchbook again because Trent has made some of the cover art for the Galaxy's Edge series before, and he used Autodesk Sketchbook in order to do it, and I thought that I should give it another shot, and I actually hated every single moment of it. I, I just hate it. Uh, I've tried it before in previous videos but the brushes are nice but what good are they if the entire interface is just a frustration and it's not something that I feel like I just need to get used to. I don't feel like I need to do anything with this software other than get rid of it. That's generally my experience with Autodesk Sketchbook to, to be honest. I mean if you if you're able to get it to work for you the way that you want it to that's great. It's a free program go ahead download it if you want that's fine and if you love it great but personally I, ha I hate Autodesk Sketchbook it's a terrible program. I even I eventually gave up on, on Autodesk Sketchbook and put everything into an Affinity Photo file and made a whole new draft at a higher resolution. If this were a commission, I wouldn't be charging any sort of artistic experimentation fees or anything like that, so ultimately, redoing work is always my fault if I have to redo it. Unless, of course, you know, the, the client were to make some sort of request that requires me to start over or something. That's the only time I would I would ever charge redoing any sort of work if we had a pre-established agreement and, and then all of a sudden it got flipped on its head. And I, I know that I've given Autodesk Sketchbook all the tries that I need to give, so I, I don't think I'm going to have to redo work because of Autodesk Sketchbook ever again, because I'm never going to use it. This image is supposed to represent the biggest moment of the story inside of the first book at Kublar. And this image also has two of the main characters. The one standing up with the sniper rifle that has a scope is 20s. Although he's not in the book a whole hell of a lot, I think that the authors of the book would appreciate me putting 20s on the cover because 20s is special. I also envision the character on his knees with something that looks more like something like an M16 or something. I envision that as Sergeant Chun. In the background, there's an image of a Republic destroyer. It's based on a book cover in the Galaxy's Edge series that already exists, and I took some liberties with the proportions and interpreted the perspective just a touch as best as I could. The previous artist to draw this particular ship design painted it rather small, and it didn't really take up a whole lot of the composition. And I'm not really quite sure if any vanishing points were used. And no, there's no judgment there. I'm not criticizing that cover. That cover looks great. But since it was so small on the composition, there were areas where I had to interpret things a little bit. Otherwise, I'd be stuck looking at an optical illusion similar to the optical illusion of that staircase that loops back into itself, and it never ends. If you envision yourself going up the staircase, you'll, you'd be going up the staircase forever. If you envision yourself going down the staircase, you'd be going down the staircase forever. It's an optical illusion, a logical loop 
happening over and over again every time you try to interpret the image what is going on there and um, yeah that's what I was getting from that tiny piece of the composition that was this uh, prior design of the ship and so I had to split the staircase in a way okay of this optical illusion and I had to split the stairs from each other and break the illusion so the perspective is more formally done inside of this image primarily because it takes up a larger portion of the composition there are no optical illusions with my iteration and draft of this particular concept design of this vehicle and uh, I think it turned out rather well um, so just like the uh, Star Wars video where I drew out fan art and just like the Babylon 5 image where I had to draw fan art this video uh, and this image that exists for Galaxy's Edge you can go ahead and download all three of these fan art images on my patreon free of charge not only that but you don't have to sign up for a mailing list in order to get these images just go to my patreon you don't even have to be one of my patrons and you can download all three of these images full resolution anyways guys that pretty much concludes it for this video if you guys enjoyed it please feel free to like share and subscribe and if you guys would like to get more notifications from me feel free to click on the bell or go ahead and follow me on twitter a link is supplied in the video description below if you'd like to participate with my community a bit more feel free to follow me on my discord a link again is supplied in the video description below if you'd like to support this channel there's an image of my mascot in the upper right corner of the screen it leads to my patreon any support would be much appreciated and if you've enjoyed this content and would like to see more feel free to click on anything else that's appearing on the screen right now. Thank you very much for your time.